we, me, I'm continuing. I'm continuing to work on my chapter summaries for introductory physics course. Calculus based. Based on Halliday, Resnick, and Walker, ninth edition. So here we are in chapter 11. Now, you know, I say this every time. There's so much stuff here, and I'm not really going to do all the derivations. So this really is just a chapter summary. Um, this chapter's got some cool stuff that I think I might go back and make some other videos on. Um, but let me just get started. So the first thing is something that I covered in the last section because I thought that I didn't look ahead. And that's the uh, rolling objects. So if an object is rolling without slipping, they call this velocity of the center mass V-com, just as a scalar. Uh, and then there's this omega. And then there's the radius R. And so the following has to be true. The point, if it's rolling without slipping, the point of contact uh, is stationary relative to the road, or the ground. Uh, so the only way that can happen is if this velocity is equal to the velocity moving back that way, or the velocity of center of mass is omega times r. And they use capital R here, I'm not sure why. Uh, you can take the derivative of, with respect to time on both sides and you get this. The acceleration of the center mass is the angular acceleration times r. So that's the physics of rolling. And then again, I actually already said this too. This would give the uh, kinetic energy for a rolling object of one half i omega squared. That's the uh, moment of inertia about the center plus one half m v squared. That's the kinetic energy of the center mass and rotational kinetic energy. This leads to the following very common problem, um, which isn't usually done this way, but I like this. I'm going to probably redo this. You know, what happens if you have uh, an object rolling without slipping down an incline of angle theta? A lot of times you can calculate the speed at the end uh, using the moment of inertia and work energy and saying, okay, well it has potential energy up here, kinetic plus potential down there, and then if it's not if it's not slipping, there should be a relationship between omega and V, and you can get this for different types of objects, cylinders, wheels, uh, spheres, whatever, whatever makes you happy. You could also do it like this. Let me draw a bigger picture. Imagine that I have a wheel, and I look at the forces acting on it. This is really fun. So I have the gravitational force. I think I did this before. I'll call this, I'll just write this as mg, pulling down. And then there's a normal force. I'll put it right here. Now I'll call that n. All right, so I'm putting it at the location where that force is applied. And then finally, there's a frictional force that you have to have a frictional force to, otherwise it's just gonna slide and not roll. And so that would be going this way. Let's see, put it up a little bit higher. F friction. If you add up all these forces, you can show, you can find, uh, and also that the, the center of mass acceleration is equal to alpha times R, you can do two equations. You could do, well, three really. Well, let's just call this the X direction. F net X equals M A X. You have these forces. Really, it's the sum of these two forces, that component in the extraction, that one. And then you have torque net about the center is equal to I alpha. And so with these three, you can solve for the acceleration of the object going down the hill. I'm almost positive I did this, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to do it again. And you get this from the book. A equals, they put a negative because it's going, the acceleration is that way, I guess. Negative A no, negative g sine theta, where that's the angle of the incline, divided by 1 plus i over m r squared. So again, it's, it's, a, it's not something that would be like, a, I think you should include in some reason, since it's, a, it's the result of a particular calculation, but it is kind of fun. Um, they also had another picture I wanted to draw. Well, I'll do it up here. They had points on a rotating sphere, and I'm going to, I'm gonna I'm gonna make this in Python, and they show the velocities of all these. So this one's has a, a velocity. This point right here is moving this way, but also that way. So it's kind of like has a velocity. I can't even do it. Um, you know, these all have super weird velocity vectors at a particular point. I want to 
make a sphere, uh, cylinder rolling in, in Python and show how those arrows all change. I just think that would be fun. But I'm trying to think about how to do that. Okay, so that's the physics of rolling. Uh, next, also something that I already covered, uh, they have torque as a vector, which is kind of weird that you introduce torque as a scalar and then later torque as a vector, but you know, whatever. R cross F. Um, you know, this is actually important uh, when we talk about the angular momentum of a particle, and I'll show you in just a second uh, why. One of the things that we have to remember about cross products is the direction of the resultant is perpendicular to both R and F. And so you have to use the right hand rule. So let's just, um, it's kind of hard to draw in, and I've, I've had a, I had a little right hand coordinate system. Aha. Oh, part of it broke. Where did the rest of it go? Well, I had a little Lego one right here, and it had another arm over there. And so you could say, imagine that it's like that. This would be R, that would be F, and that would be the torque. So it's in three dimensions. I'll, I'll remake that. I I'm really, really apologize for not doing that. Um, and, and that does matter in some cases, but pretty much the only time that will really come into, into play in this course is with a demo, which I'll talk about later. Okay, so that's the, where I went over that. The next thing, very big thing, angular momentum. I can't spell. So they actually have two different symbols. I always use the same symbol. Uh, they have the angular momentum of a particle and the angular momentum of a, of a rigid object. So imagine that I have this as my origin and that's point O and then I have an object over here. Let's just say it's moving this way with a momentum P and then I make the vector uh, here R. I can determine the ang I can define the angular momentum. They use lowercase l for the momentum of a particle as r cross p. So again, the the direction of this is perpendicular to both r and p, which would be uh, this case would be into the paper. Um, but you could also find the magnitude of l as r p sine theta, where that's the angle theta. It turns out that, uh, <laughs> this is always a fun one, if I have an object moving with a constant momentum uh, past a point like this, past a point, the angular momentum is constant. So even though R changes and the angle changes, uh, R cross P is constant. Okay, so if something's not turning, then it has a constant angular momentum, not zero, but constant, okay? and then the value of the angular momentum would depend on your point. If I want to find the angular momentum about this point, uh, it passes right through that point, so you'd actually have zero angular momentum, but it'd still be constant, okay? So the, the choice of where you pick that point to calculate the angular momentum about is indeed important. Then they go on to say, well, what if you have, uh, what if you have something like this? Uh, let's, say, let's say it's a circle with some masses fixed to it, not just three. Then, and it's rotating like that. Then uh, the angular momentum, and this is one, two, three, is gonna be R1 cross P1 plus R2 cross P2 plus R3 cross P3. So it'd be the sum of the angular momentums. But it turns out, and I'm not going to derive it, you could write this as L, capital L, as I omega. Technically, that would be a vector too. Where I is the moment of inertia. So you can actually get that from up here. Okay, so, because you see I have R, and then I'm going to get uh, MV. Um, and from that, you can get the M, oh, you get an MR squared. You do get a distance squared and per second here. It, it does work out. I'm not going to derive it. 
So, and remember that I is the moment of inertia. It's a sum over I, M I, R I squared. So that's that. Angular velocity is technically a vector. If you put your thumb of your right hand in the direction, and your, well, your fingers in the direction that the thing rotates, your thumb of your right hand will point in the direction of the angular velocity vector. I don't know that they do that too much, but that would be the same thing for the angular momentum vector. And if, if the axis of rotation is fixed and I is a scalar, which is what it's going to be in this course, then that would be true. The angular momentum and the angular velocity vector would be in the same directions. Now we get to the third biggest idea, the angular momentum principle. This just says that the net torque about some point O, remember that point does matter, is dl dt. It's the rate of change of the angular momentum. And it looks a lot like the momentum principle. Remember this, F net equals M, I'm sorry, dp dt. And p is mv, l is i omega. So you see how everything looks so nice, right? Rotational force, force. Angular momentum, momentum. Angular time, time. I'm just kidding about this time. Derivatives, and then even the momentum is mass and velocity, and i is like the rotational mass and the rotational angular, the rotational velocity. So it all just works out nice. Now, if you have a situ situation where the net torque is zero, zero vector, then L1 equals L2. Because if dl dt is zero, then L is constant, so the, the angular momentum is constant. And that's conservation of angular momentum. The final thing is they do have uh, a thing about precession. Um, it's way more complicated than it makes it out to be. But if you have, I don't even want to talk about it. It's just too com it's not really it's not really appropriate for introductory level courses. It just adds in something that you can read about in the book. But I mean, it it just it's just really kind of complicated. It's cool, but I just it, it deals with a lot of vectors and stuff like that. So I think I'll just end there. Um, yeah, it, it yeah. Oh, I did say one thing. I was going to say about torque as a vector. Okay, let's just do this one. Here's the sun. Don't look at the sun. Don't look at the sun. And suppose there is a uh, comet or something orbiting like this. Um, so in this case, if I have this is my system, and that my point, that's R, that's P, then you see that uh, R, and then this is the force. Right, the force is in the same direction as R. Since the force is in the same direction as R, there's no torque. So the angular momentum of this be constant. But since there's a force on that, it actually will speed up. So in this case, if this is unstationary, which is technically not stationary, then uh, the angular momentum would be constant as it moves around, but the momentum would not be. Okay, I think that's good enough. Remember, this is just a summary. You still need to read the book. You still need to do homework. You still need to practice. Uh, but hopefully this helps. Uh, I want to make some of these things, but we'll we'll just see. That's it. Later.